Okay, the webinar started. So welcome everyone to Efficiency Vermont's webinar about rebuilding after the flood. I'm Matthew Smith, Efficiency Vermont's Public Relations Manager, and I have a couple of experts with me today to answer your questions, and they are, Li Ling Young, an engineering consultant with Efficiency Vermont with experience in residential projects. Hi, Li Ling. Hi, Matt. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I live in Richmond, and we're here in our Winooski office this evening. Also joining us today is Matt Sharp, another of our engineering consultants. Hi, Matt. Hi. Good to be here. I live down in Madison County, and Uh, Matt, I'm going to introduce the rest of the folks here, but your mic is sounding a little funky, so if you could just uh, adjust that for me, I appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, also with us today, Brad Long, one of our community managers specializing in small and medium businesses and working with rental property owners. Hi, Brad. And we also have Allison Jerram, an Efficiency Vermont Energy Advisor. Hi, Allison. Hello, great to be here. I live in Winooski and I uh, answer calls on behalf of Efficiency Vermont. Thanks, Allison. We're going to get started here. So if you have a question, feel free to share it in the chat. We'll be collecting them and reading them uh, and answering them later on. But before we go any further, let's review what we're going to cover today. First, we'll cover in our webinar uh, some some resources for reporting damage and getting help from FEMA, the state, and other resources. We'll have a review of some of Efficiency Vermont's resources that are available now and more that will be coming in September. We'll talk through some important ideas around rebuilding your home. We'll share some resources for small business owners, and we'll have a QA. and a And a reminder, send in those questions now in the chat. Our colleagues are working hard to collect them, and we'll answer them as we move along here. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Speaking of questions, a poll is popping up in your screen right now. Please take a moment and tell us why you're joining us on this webinar tonight, if you've been impacted by the flood or if you're attending more out of general interest in this topic. If you could fill out uh, that little poll, we'd appreciate it. Okay, now before we go any further, before we say another word about rebuilding, we have to stress just how important it is to make sure that you are clearing through and going through the FEMA process and the insurance process first. Now for insurance, it's important to get in touch with your insurer, whether that's flooding insurance, homeowners insurance, renters insurance, even car insurance. FEMA wants documentation of what your insurance will cover and what it won't. For FEMA, you have to complete every step in their process first. That includes applying, inspection, any appeals you may need to make on your application. We can't stress this enough. You could jeopardize your FEMA application if you receive funding, additional funding that is, before you complete FEMA's process. So make sure you do that before you receive any Efficiency Vermont rebates or offers. Okay, now reporting damage and getting help. If you haven't already reported any flood damage, do so right now to FEMA or to Vermont 211. As of this week, FEMA has declared disasters in nine counties. You can contact FEMA if you live in one of those counties that are on your screen right now. If you live outside of those counties, government officials are asking you to report that damage by calling Vermont 211. If you're in Addison County, which just saw some damaging rains and flash flooding last week, FEMA has told Vermont media they are still determining an end date for the July disaster declaration. So it's not too late to report flood damage. Even if you think you don't need help, Reporting that flood damage is really important. Making a report helps your neighbors, it helps your community, it helps improve plans for future flood response at the state and local levels and much more. Again, even if you don't think you need the help, report flood damage to FEMA or Vermont 211. While we're telling you how to report damage, you likely also have questions about your home and your rebuilding efforts. We'll have some answers for those later in the webinar, but you can always call and get connected to Efficiency Vermont customer support. And my colleague, Allison, will tell you how to do just that. Um, next slide, oh, sorry, please. Allison, go ahead. All right, so customer support is available for Efficiency Vermont Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, and our number is 888-921-5990. You can also send an email to info at efficiencyvermont.com. 
Uh, we're available to answer any questions you may have about our standard weatherization programs as well as uh, flood specific um, weatherization questions. We field questions on uh, HVAC um, improvements, especially those involving heat pumps. Um, we can walk you through low and moderate income programs available as well as financing options. Thank you, Thank Allison. You. All right, let's just take a moment and recognize that this whole process is hard, it's exhausting, and for many people, it can feel overwhelming. Support is available at the numbers that are on your screen right now. Disaster Distress Line is a 1-800 call or text line that can connect you to recovery resources as well as mental health resources. And the Crisis Line, call or text 988, that is 24 hours a day, call or text. Early data from these July floods tells us that the damage may surpass what we saw in Tropical Storm Irene. And there's even more recent flooding, as we just mentioned, in Addison County, Rutland, their other towns in Vermont. So as you're taking care of yourself, you're taking care of others, you're taking care of your home, help is available if you're feeling overwhelmed. You are not alone. All right, so some Efficiency Vermont flood resources that are available now. You can visit our website, efficiencyvermont.com slash flood. A list of resources from Efficiency Vermont, state and federal organizations are on there. We also have links to financing options, help for businesses, for farms, much, much more. Um, there are other resources from Efficiency Vermont that are av available now, and I'll hand it over to Allison here to tell you about those. So in addition to um, the flood uh, resource page we have available, our website, um, as well as the customer support department can also give you information on uh, the virtual home energy visit service that we provide. Uh, it's typically a 90 minute appointment uh, taking place over um, a Teams or um, you know, video chat environment. Um, you are welcome to review the qualifying products list for any appliances or electronics that need to be replaced uh, that we do have a current rebate for. Um, and we also maintain a list of contractors within the Efficiency Excellence Network who are available to assist with um, improvements needed. Sorry, Allison, I jumped the gun on switching the slide there. I apologize. <laughs> That's all right. That. Yeah. Um, so uh, you may have heard in the news, Efficiency Vermont has been approved to redirect uh, some $10 million of funding to help flood impacted Vermont homeowners and renters rebuild and recover. That program is currently being set up and details will be announced soon. And that program will be live in September. What we can say about this program today is that it is available for residential customers and the funds will help offset the cost of qualifying items. That includes efficient home heating systems, heat pump water heating systems, and efficient appliance replacements. Business owners, Efficiency Vermont is working to set up a separate flood relief program for you, so stay tuned for those details as well. You can sign up on our website if, uh, to be alerted through our newsletter when those programs are live. And I can put that, uh, put that link in the chat in a moment. All right, so we're gonna be talking about rebuilding, but let's also recognize that some people are in a different part of this long recovery process. Cleanup takes a long time and it can take longer depending on your home, your location, how much damage you're dealing with. If you're still in this cleanup process, that's okay. And as we mentioned earlier, we've seen more recent flooding in just the last week. <clears throat> For some people, this damage happened just days ago. So let's acknowledge the hard work cleaning up requires. If you're still cleaning up, the EPA has some excellent resources that can help. We'll link that as well, some EPA uh, flood cleanup guidance. Now, many in Vermont are moving on to the next phase, the rebuilding phase. So let's dive into some important information about that now, and then we'll get to your questions. And I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Lee Ling. Thanks, Matt. So before we start talking about uh, repair or making any changes to your home, we just want to set the stage for understanding how your home works as a system. All the parts of your home are all connected and they affect all the other parts of your home. And when you make changes to any part of your home, it can impact the comfort, the safety, and the healthfulness of the inside of your building. So air sealing is 
probably the thing that's going to affect you the most in terms in in places that you'll recognize so your comfort maybe the air quality um and air sealing might just come along with any repairs that you do even if you're not intending to air seal if you are replacing combustion equipment, so anything that burns fuel or liquid fuel or even wood, you should think about getting sealed combustion equipment. And that means that your combustion equipment is using outdoor air to burn and it's not communicating with the indoor environment. So that will protect the indoor environment from um, pollutants that are byproducts of combustion. And at Efficiency Vermont, Whenever we make recommendations, we're always thinking about building science. So some of the things that we recommend might seem a little far afield from perhaps what you're thinking about, but it's because we're keeping an eye on the building science issues. So an important decision before you start rebuilding is what part of the building are you trying to control in terms of temperature, humidity, and air quality? You wanna put your efforts into the boundary between the controlled part of the building, so the place that you're occupying and you expect to be comfortable there, and those other spaces, which can be considered buffer spaces. And we call that boundary the thermal enclosure. It's okay to exclude the basement from the house, just like most homes exclude the attic. But if you do that, the boundary between the house and the basement or between the occupied parts of the building and the basement needs to be made airtight and well insulated. On the other hand, if you're including the basement within the thermal enclosure, you need the outside of the basement. So that's the basement walls, part of the top of the basement walls, that's the perimeter of the floor system, um, a bulkhead door, all that stuff needs to be made airtight and well insulated if the basement is within the thermal boundary. If you have chilly floors in the winter and hot bedrooms in the summer, that's almost always related to air leakage. And as you go along doing rebuilding, Air sealing a building is gonna make it possible for you to control the temperature and the humidity and the indoor air quality. So air sealing is just as important as insulation as you rebuild. And even if you think you're not changing your building, you should pay attention to the systems that are impacting air quality. So as I said, burning fuel inside the building, that's something where you're introducing pollutants into the interior and you wanna make sure that all those pollutants can get out well. So a chimney that might have worked with the old furnace and water heater, it might not draft as well if you replace that furnace uh, with a new, more highly high efficient furnace and an electric water heater. So, you know, there's a change that might not seem like it's going to impact the air quality, but it could. And if you aren't planning for a ventilation system, this might be the time to consider it because you're already doing work in the home and you could fold it in with the other work that you're getting done. Um, and then finally, to the top of your house, most people didn't suffer damage to the top of their home, but as long as you're getting work done in your house, you should consider air sealing the attic. So either the floor of the attic, if that's where the insulation is, or along the slope of the roof, if that's where your insulation is, because a leaky boundary between the house and the attic can make it hard for the chimney to draft. It can pull in moisture and soil gases from the basement, and it can prematurely age your roof with ice dams and it can even create mold on the roof sheathing. So the attic is something to consider even if that's not where most of your work is happening. So let's talk about drying. Drying is a long process. Um, the, the thing that probably most people are concerned about in terms of drying is how do you know when it's dry enough? Uh, we recommend that your contractor use a moisture meter to measure the moisture content of your building materials. For wood, we're looking for something less than 15%, and that's when it's safe to start enclosing it. Um, some people are wondering about um, indoor air quality and uh, sensors that measure indoor air quality, and we'll address that later in the presentation. I think we're moving on to uh, Matt Sharp to talk about weatherization as we rebuild. Hi, thank you, Matt. And thank you, Liling, for that. <clears throat> um, so for the insulation and air sealing, we are hearing a lot 
um, from folks who have been affected by the by the flooding about how you would like to do things right when you put it back together or maybe better than what you had before um, and use this as an opportunity to increase your efficiency. Um, so the, the these kind of break down into a few different categories about approach and what materials you might choose to use. Um, the, the three general approaches that <clears throat> we're kind of seeing people gravitate towards are either using impermeable materials um, that can withstand getting wet and be usable afterwards. Um, these include things like a closed cell foam, either spray or board type. Um, <clears throat> another approach that might be considered is to use a material that uh, can dry and can possibly be reused, um, something like rock wool, bats that, uh, that, that could dry if not contaminated by the floodwaters. Um, and then the other approach is to you know, use a material that, that might be more carbon friendly, um, something like cellulose or wood fiber, and taking the approach that you know, if such significant damage happens again, then the walls will have to be gutted again regardless. Therefore, it doesn't really matter what is there, uh, make it something that is of best service now um, understanding that it might need to be removed if you were to be affected again. Um, <clears throat> you know, you definitely want to defer to what you're hearing from FEMA or insurance companies about whether there are any rules about how you put things back together uh, as, a, as a first priority to um, uh, receiving that funding and support. The other piece um, besides what installation choices you might want to make is air sealing. Um, so like Li Ling alluded to, there is an opportunity here now that you have the wall taken apart, um, you might have window casings taken off where windows could be air sealed in place now where they weren't previously before. Um, caulking could be placed along baseboards and other openings that allow that have allowed air to pass through the building in the past. And take this chance to seal every area that you can um, and make it as tight as possible. There are contractors that specialize in this kind of work, efficiency excellence net network contractors. Uh, we have a list of on our website and uh, reaching out to them for support is a, is a great start to, uh, to see what might be able to, uh, what you might be able to do to improve the efficiency of your house as you rebuild. Um, basements. Um, basements can be very specific to the house. You know, there are um, a lot of, a, a large variety of basement scenarios out there. Um, the challenge with basements has always been, it's the lowest part of the building. It's a connection to ground. It always presents some challenges to moisture and water management. Um, but there are ways to uh, protect yourself some by uh, choosing material, perhaps potentially like a closed cell foam that could withstand flooding in the future. And uh, there are other methods to keep your basement dry using some, some combination of um, drainage to sump pumps and poly vapor barriers and continuity from those things to insulation layers. So your basement can really become a, a dry uh, usable place um, as a, an option. And the, the other, on the other end, there's some thought in, in some locations where you might want to completely abandon the basement and uh, no longer rely on it to hold your mechanical systems and um, move your thermal boundary to the floor or the ceiling of the basement and move everything, uh, pipes included, up into the thermally conditioned space that is outside of the basement area. Obviously, there are some significant challenges with that. Um, but that is one consideration when, when you're faced with the potential for a basement to flood again. Okay, we're going to move on to mechanical systems here, and I'm going to send it back over to Matt Sharp. <clears throat> yeah, so for mechanical systems, we're, we are hearing a lot of damage to mechanical systems, and, and that is primarily because they are located in the lowest part of the building often. Um, and, and thus get inundated when the flooding comes in. Uh, so want to recognize that um, <clears throat> the, 
want to recognize that the easiest and fastest thing sometimes can be to replace what you have uh, at what you have had in the past. And <clears throat> that uh, can be a difficult decision, but it's something that you know is going to be top of mind and readily available, most likely, without a lot of planning. Um, next slide, please. Sure thing, Matt. Um, <clears throat> some things to consider when you are replacing what you have. There is, a, is an opportunity to get sealed combustion direct vent units. And, and these are um, you know, uh, vented directly out the side of the wall without going into a chimney. Um, the, there are also, if you have a hot water system, um, a hot water heating system through baseboard or, or whatnot, there are combi boilers that are combination uh, hot water and domestic heating for water um, that can be wall hung and they tend to be able to be placed uh, you know, three feet off the floor or potentially even in a small closet if you wanted to move them out of the basement, which could offer you some protection for that unit uh, in case of a future flood. And the other thing we are hearing a lot about is um, oils, tanks and oil infrastructure being damaged that had been located in a basement. And there are a lot of aging chimneys out there and possibly faced with a lot of infrastructure changes to go back to an oil system. And LP, you know, liquid propane fuel is one of those options um, to move away from storing the fuel in the basement, storing it outside. And those propane systems can also be um, direct vented and high efficiency. So that is one consideration for replacement. Um, whatever you're replacing, it's, it's good to look for the Energy Star label. That's a, a good sign of a high efficiency unit that would qualify for federal tax credits and is often looked to as the symbol of an efficient equipment for other programs. Um, so that's always a good thing to, to keep an eye out for. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> in the event that you want to be searching for an alternative to what you had, the, there are heat pump alternatives that could apply and could be a feasible installation for you. On the water heating side, there are heat pump water heaters. Uh, these units, they, they do tend to take up um, a fair amount of space, meaning they need volume of air to work well. So they are a good basement solution. They are the most efficient solution and the, the most cost efficient solution as far as operation cost. Um, <clears throat> they, there are opportunities to install these in closets or small spaces, but they would have to have some, some air supply and, and other considerations uh, to do that. And in which case you might consider an on-demand system if you are gonna relocate your water heating out of the basement, uh, those can be placed in, in very small areas. On the heating side, there are you know, two, two, generally two different kinds of heating, central heating systems. You have boilers that um, produce hot water and distribute that around oftentimes baseboard or radiators. Um, and there, there are air to water heat pumps. They, they are a very difficult retrofit, uh, mainly because they tend to require a low temperature distribution system, which would be a, a radiant floor. Um, <clears throat> so a very kind of, um, potentially unique situation, but if you are faced with having to replace the distribution as well, then that could be an option that you consider. Um, wood pellet boilers are another option that is uh, alternative to, to what you might've had before. Uh, these tend to need a, a fairly large storage area for pellets, um, but can be a good way to distribute hot water through a, a, a wood pellet system. And then there are the, the ductless heat pumps. And you know, if, if your boiler distribution is not a good fit for something like an air to water system, um, a ductless mini splits, they, they wouldn't have basement components. So, that, so they could be uh, you know, one of those strategies to, to remove the systems from the basement. And these would be you know, hung on the wall or placed on the floor by exterior walls in various rooms to provide heating. And these can work very well, especially with a, a wood or a pellet stove supplement um, to, to get you through the entire heating season. 
On the furnace side, these are furnaces typically referred to for warm air systems. There are ducted heat pumps that are uh, a, a reasonable thing to consider. Um, you do need to make sure the ductwork that you have is adequate. Um, and these can generally be sized to meet most, if not all, the heat in some homes, especially if that home has, has had its weatherization work done. And you can add heat recovery ventilation to these units because you have ductwork that's going to distribute that fresh air around the house. And then um, finally, electrical. Um, you know, so a lot of electric panels were submerged as well. And the, you know, I always want to say consult your electrician um, to see if something needs to be replaced. Um, if you do need to replace your panel, now's a good time to consider what your future plans might be in terms of uh, doing heat pumps or some kind of electri electrification, whether it's uh, electric vehicles or changing your appliances to be electric and make sure the panel is sized to be able to accommodate what those future needs might be. Thanks very much, Matt. We're gonna move into promoting a healthy indoor environment and I'm gonna hand it over to Lee Ling again. Am I back? Yeah, there you are. Thanks for joining us, Lee Ling. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Um, so probably as you rebuild, you're acutely aware of the need to build a healthy indoor environment. We've had a lot of questions and just frankly, people expressing their concerns about their indoor environment. And so we know this is top of mind for many people. The elements of a healthy building are pretty straightforward, although that doesn't mean that they're necessarily easy to build. So top of the list here, clean. Of course, many of you have a big cleaning job ahead of you, but once you get the building cleaned up, think about how you're gonna keep it clean. So think about selecting your materials. Um, is there a place to knock dirt off your shoes when you come in the house? Um, are the flooring and walls cleansable? So clean is the first element of a healthy building. Dry is the next one I'm gonna talk about. It doesn't have to be a flood to create a wet enough environment for bad air quality. So um, as you rebuild, make sure exterior flashing effectively keeps rain off and out of the building. Um, take care of basement moisture. If your basement was damp before the flood, it's still gonna be damp after the flood. So um, take you know whatever measures it takes to um, keep moisture out of your basement. And I think that we'll return to that in a, in a uh, later slide. Uh, in terms of roof water, this is where the largest bulk of water is gonna come you know, on a, on a regular basis where your building is gonna see the largest volume of just liquid water. So collect that roof water, um, drain it away from the building. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is air sealing. So we've mentioned this a few different times. The way that air sealing contributes to a healthy indoor environment is it creates a way for you to be able to control the indoor environment. Um, it's sometimes assumed that air sealing makes a building unhealthy, but here's a different way to think about it. Once you gain control of your indoor environment, that's when you can control the air quality. Air sealing can keep pests out. Um, it can keep a house from being too dry in the winter. And air sealing is helpful for comfortable, for comfort, energy conservation, and having good indoor air quality. So the next one is uh, safe combustion. So anything that burns inside your building needs to be effectively vented to the outside. New boilers or furnaces probably will have a power venter that gets the combustion gases out. Um, chimney vented devices, so these are ones that would not have a power venter, um, whether those are liquid fuel, like an oil boiler, or wood, um, like a, a wood stove venting into a chimney, all of those need a strong chimney draft. So the um, the quality or the condition of the chimney um, and really everything else in your house. You know, the first thing that I talked about was that the home is, everything in the building is connected to everything else. Um, all of those things can affect whether the chimney, dra chimney drafts well. And you do need a good strong chimney draft if you're gonna be using the chimney to get your combustion plant, uh, devices or combustion gases out of the house. If you burn gas for cooking, we strongly recommend some way to exhaust the kitchen air while you're cooking. So that might be a vented range hood or some other exhaust device in the kitchen. 
um, a healthy building needs a reliable way to get all the combustion gases out, no matter where they originate. Um, the next one would be ventilation. So a whole building system for putting fresh air where people spend the most time is always a good idea. Not many homes or public buildings have a ventilation system, but if you're making repairs to your building, it's probably the right time to at least consider it. Figure out how to add ventilation. Um, you might discover at the end of that con consideration, uh, this isn't something I can handle right now, but it's not too early to start thinking about it. Along with a well-sealed building, ventilation gives you the ability to control the air quality by putting fresh air where you want it, at the right time, and in the right amount. Finally, if you feel like you wanna measure the air quality in your building, there are lots of choices of indoor air quality monitor. Typical pollutants that are measured by indoor air quality monitors are temperature, humidity, carbon monoxide, um, which comes from incomplete combustion of any fuel, carbon dioxide, which comes just from people breathing, um, volatile organic compounds, which is like the smelly part of new furniture or cleaning products, um, particulates, which is like sooty stuff or dust or um, uh, pollen. Sometimes they measure radon. However, consumer air quality monitors are not a good way to figure out whether you have active mold growing in your building. Um, Matt, are you going to be able to put a link to the list? Yeah, of air quality monitors. There um, it is. So, thank you. So this is a, an outfit that has reviewed air quality monitors and has a list of them online. So if you really feel like an air quality monitor is the right thing for your building, check out the list. Okay, thanks, Li Ling. We're gonna talk about some resources for businesses now, and I'm, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Brad Long. Brad. Hi, folks, can you hear me now? We can. All right, great. Well, I'm Brad Long. I'm with Efficiency Vermont. I live in Faiston. Uh, and I'm here to chat with you just quickly about some of the uh, business services we offer. Um, a lot of businesses were, were um, damaged in the flooding. And uh, when we speak about businesses here, I just wanna um, let everybody know we're talking about um, brick and mortar type locations. We're talking about farms, agricultural um, types of, um, of work environments, we're talking about at home businesses. Um, so if you're running a small, medium sized business in Vermont, uh, we have some services available for you. Um, we do offer consultative services, so we can offer some energy assessments of your building. Um, and we can um, also offer um, walkthroughs of your, of your building for a small, medium business. Um, when we are doing those walkthroughs, we try to identify um, areas that could see improvements in energy use um, and also help you address areas of concerns that you may have. Uh, and we try to leverage our incentives that we have available uh, to businesses. And some of those incentives are commercial lighting, some are related to heating, ventilation, air conditioning equipment, commercial kitchen equipment, controls, greenhouse equipment, and high performance motors and pumps. So if you can let us know what types of uh, equipment was damaged, uh, we'll be happy to uh, work with you to see if we can uh, find a more efficient piece of equipment and match it with an incentive to make it a more affordable purchase for you. Um, if you're looking for contractors to help uh, rebuild your, your business or your, your location there, um, our, our Efficiency Excellence Network contractor um, of independent, our, our group of independent contractors is there to help and we'll be happy to make a referral for you. Um, finally, this can be expensive and um, it can be a, a challenge. And um, one of the uh, services we offer is a partnership with credit unions throughout the state so we can help with um, some financing um, and support that way as well. Rental property owners. Um, so yes, it's very similar to a, a, a business um, for us uh, in the sense that we offer consultative services and we also offer um, uh, an ability to uh, meet on site if it's um, if it's something that is helpful for you to take a look at your your location and help assess some of the damage. Um, right now, any rental property owner in the state can take uh, advantage of free LED lighting, some water saving technologies, and some hot water piping insulation. Um, and uh, if if it's a non owner occupied uh, rental property, um, we have enhanced appliance rebates available. Um, the the rental property field is 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 uh, wide. Uh, we have everything from duplexes to 20 unit buildings in the state. My uh, my piece of advice would be to call us, give us a buzz, tell us about your particular property and what kind of challenges you're facing, and we'll see where we can help. 
Thanks. Thanks very much, Brad. So we're going to move into some question and answers in this par portion of the webinar. And we have a number of questions that have come into Efficiency Vermont in recent weeks. We've also gotten a couple that came in through email ahead of this webinar. So we're going to address a couple of those questions that we're hearing from many Vermonters first. And we're going to continue collecting questions from the chat. So again, if you have a question, please go ahead and put it in the chat. And we'll try to be getting, we'll try to get to that in a few minutes. First, a couple common questions about drying. Uh, Li Ling, I'm going to send this first question your way. This question is, my house isn't drying because it's humid and it keeps raining. What's the fastest way to dry my basement or home? There you go. I think, yep. I think I'm back. <laughs> no, you're back. Okay. So we have uh, three main tools at our disposal for drying anything out. Um, the first would be uh, air movement using fans. The second would be de dehumidification, of course, using a dehumidifier, and then heating. Even in this time of year, heating is going to assist with that. After all the bulk water has been removed, so you know we don't want to start trying to dry things out if there's still liquid water around, um, and also soggy uh, belongings and materials, after all that's been removed, use fans to dry as much um, as possible, but that is going to be limited by how humid it is outside. If it's very humid, fans aren't going to do um, much in the way of drying. It's not going to be very rapid to dry that way. When it's time to use a dehumidifier, you actually need to close up the building against the outdoors because you're trying to create a, a controlled environment, you know, a, a space where you're saying, this is where I want to dehumidify. I don't want to de dehumidify the sidewalk or the backyard. Um, and then finally, uh, you can speed up the drying by heating up the space because it's gonna evaporate the moisture out of the materials faster. And if you're gonna take that approach, then use um, you know, a fan to uh, control air moving through the space so that you're making sure to carry out that humid air. If you're gonna try this, you know, heating up your space with electric space heaters, be careful about overloading um, circuits and, um, uh, it also, you don't want to use an unvented propane salamander to, um, you know, salamander is a tri type of unvented space heater. Um, and of course, unvented means that it's introducing all the moisture and byproducts of combustion into the building. So you don't want to use that kind of device for heating. Thanks, Li Ling. I heard you mention a dehumidifier. So I want to hand it over to my colleague, Allison, here and tell us about some of those dehumidifier rebates we have, Allison, if you would. Sure, so for certain Energy Star certified models of dehumidifier, we do offer a rebate on those, typically between $25 and $40. Um, and the qualified product list uh, that I mentioned before does have uh, the dehumidifier list on it. So do check the model that you're considering uh, before applying for the rebate. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. Another question for you, Leeling. Um, how do I know it's safe to insulate and replace sheetrock in my home? Yeah, I'm assuming this question really came from the question of um, what, how do I know it's safe in terms of it's dry enough? And uh, as I mentioned earlier, a, a moisture meter can be used to measure the moisture content of building materials. So your contractor uh, should use a moisture meter to determine how um, wet or dry the building materials are, it's true that you don't want to start to enclose things if they haven't dried fully. So um, for wood, we're looking for 15% moisture content. Um, and uh, I, I think that's all I'm going to say about that now because I see that there's some other questions coming in the chat about that. And maybe we'll be able to return to it. Yeah, um, uh, Li Ling, I, someone did ask a very specific question in the chat about sheetrock, and I'm going to pose it to you now. So this question is, how do you deal with air sealing when you've removed four feet of sheetrock and the poly vapor barrier from a 1980s edition? Yeah, um, so we're making a distinction between air sealing and the vapor retarder or the vapor barrier. The, the vapor retarder is going to prevent moisture from migrating through a building assembly. Um, and according to Vermont's energy code, you do need to have a vapor barrier um, in most wall assemblies. That's a little bit different from air sealing. So air sealing would be sealing up the holes and cracks. Um, it's true that air sealing will reduce the amount of air that's moving through an assembly, but 
um, moisture can be introduced into those assemblies in different ways. So air sealing should be done with materials specific to air sealing. That would be caulk and spray foam and some tapes even are designed for air sealing. Um, a good vapor barrier um, approach, particularly now that we're all attuned to the fact that buildings can maybe expect to see some uh, big water in their lifetimes, uh, in our lifetimes, uh, then a, a good vapor barrier approach might be uh, a smart vapor barrier, which can adjust how vapor open or closed it is so that it can allow some drying. So that might be one approach or um, using a vapor barrier primer paint. So if you're replacing your sheetrock, this is a good time for you to think about creating a vapor retarder or vapor barrier using vapor barrier primer. Thanks, Li Ling. This next question we have on the slide in front of us here. I'm going to send your way, Matt Sharp. Um, before the flood, my basement was damp. Is there any way to fix it before I replace my boiler and put my belongings back? <clears throat> yeah, um, basements tend to be damp, and it's a very common scenario where we would see a damp basement or you might have a damp basement. Um, and as long as it's in the damp category and not the wet category, um, you know, damp basements can be dealt with through using poly vapor barriers across any, any dirt floors. Um, and that can be wrapped up the wall some and a, something like a closed cell spray foam uh, down the wall to connect to that it can really lock out the dampness. Now, if you in the wet basement category where you actually have water coming in, um, it, it might depend on really how bad it is, at what lengths you go. Um, there are specialist uh, contractors that deal with wet basements. That's always an option. Um, but basically, you want to try to divert the, you know, start as far as close to the water as you can and divert any water away from the basement that you can where it's coming towards the house. So this would be putting gutters on with downspouts that kick the water away from the foundation. Um, if you don't have gutters, maybe put those on. And on the inside, if water is still getting in, whether that's um, groundwater coming up or, or surface water coming down, you know, an interior drain, uh, like a French drain type of thing connected to a sump pump that is covered and completely locked out with a moisture barrier on top of it all. So all the drainage happens underneath that moisture barrier to a sump pump that then pumps the water out. And, and when you do something like that, you can safely insulate it um, because you're locking all the moisture uh, away from uh, the, the air space and the volume of air that's gonna be inside your house. Thanks for that answer, Matt. Um, I hear a couple mentions of moisture monitors uh, in the questions we've covered so far. And I just want to say, I see Jill's comment in the chat. As a director of a Vermont public library, your community library may have a moisture meter that patrons can borrow to get an idea of dryness in your home. So thanks for sharing that in the chat there, Jill. I'm going to move on to some questions we've gotten ahead of the webinar about insulation. Matt Sharp, I think this first one's going to come to you. So the question is, what is a more flood-proof way of insulating my basement? I don't want to have to pull out the soggy fiberglass again. <clears throat> um, <laughs> flood-proof is a is a tough uh, tough one to meet, but um, there are insulation products that will uh, not absorb water, and, and that really comes into the closed cell foam products like spray foam closed cell spray foam or the board, some of the board foams that you might be able to apply to a flat foundation wall. Um, we have heard some reports from people that have had spray foam in their basement be able to wash it off um, and not have to pull it out and replace it. Now, obviously, if, it's an, if you have a wood framed wall and you have spray foam sprayed around and encasing the wood, um, that still could be resistant, but you really want to make sure you're going to dry that wood out before you close it back up. And that can take a very long time and require some active drying methods, like Leeling mentioned, you know, adding heat and, and dehumidification and testing the wood for moisture before you're closing it back up. So those are a couple options. Matt Sharp, uh, and a follow up question that came in through the chat. Um, when it comes to spray foam, is there a difference if it's open cell or closed cell? And is it a different answer if the foam simply got wet versus was flooded for hours or days? 
there is certainly a difference between open cell and closed cell. That's a really good thing to call out. Um, open cell will absorb moisture. So that is essentially no different than a cellulose or a fiberglass in that case where it's gonna get soaked. Um, closed cell foam on the other hand does not absorb moisture. Um, so that is the type of foam you would wanna use if you want it to be resistant to water. Now, as far as, you know, is there a time constraint or a time factor here? Uh, I mean, I think I would leave that to the contamination experts. I mean, as far as the product goes, what I understand is that it's going to be resistant to the moisture, but you wanna make sure that if there were any other um, uh, contamination that, that happened during the flooding, that it is able to be cleaned properly if that's the route you're gonna go. Thanks, Matt. Uh, this next question on the slide in front of us here is, uh, I'm gonna send your way, Li Ling. So this question is, the belly of my mobile home got flooded. How can I put back the insulation? I'm really glad that we have a chance to address this. Um, so one of the advantages here is that uh, if you're pulling out all the insulation, soggy it probably is, uh, under a mobile home or a manufactured home, then you have an opportunity to get up parts of the house that probably really need some work. The first would be the duct system. Take this opportunity with everything out of the way to clean and seal the duct system. Sealed ducts is probably the most important thing you can do to save energy in a manufactured home and increase your comfort. Um, so there's an upside there. You have a chance to do that um, in this circumstance. The next thing would be to air seal the floor of the home. So anywhere that wires go through, um, where the drain comes out, air seal that. Then to replace the insulation, uh, you have to enclose it somehow. I suggest uh, some kind of building wrap like Tyvek or Tipar. Um, you wanna seal the perimeter of that. Um, and where, you know, if it makes overlaps in somewhere in the center, you need to seal that part too. There's a lot of complicated um, framing underneath a manufactured home. So you'll have to seal around everywhere that you had to cut it to accommodate whatever is under there. Um, so anyway, seal that up and then, pumped inside this bag that you're creating with the Tyvek or the Tipar, you wanna put um, blown in fiberglass insulation. Um, it's true that probably what you're pulling out of that it's all soggy is fiberglass, but that's really the best product for underneath the manufactured home. And then finally, you wanna put a vapor retarder down on the ground underneath the home and enclose the whole thing with insulated skirting. Thanks very much, Li Ling. Um, gonna move on to our next slide, which has a question that's come in in many different forms, including in the chat just a, a moment ago here. Um, the chat question is, can you ensure a, ho uh, sorry, uh, can you uh, replace heat pumps as a primary heat without wood backup? And as we have on this um, slide here as well, pardon me, um, people are asking about place, uh, replacing a furnace, a water heater, and a clothes washer, something they've lost again in the flood, they don't wanna go through this. Could I move everything out of the basement? I think I selected the wrong question there on the, the slide, but Matt Sharp, I'm gonna ask you that question about moving appliances out of the basement. Yes, yeah, so there, um, as far as appliances moving out of the basement, um, yes, you know, that is something to consider. Uh, especially if you expect your basement to be flooded again or has the potential to. Um, the key there becomes, you know, where are you going to put things um, in a way that's going to allow them to work? So um, some things to keep in mind is that, uh, um, you know, some clothes dryers now can be ventless clothes dryers or heat pump or condensing clothes dryers that don't require a vent. So maybe that's easier to relocate out of the basement so you don't have to find a vent path. Um, there's also, um, you know, sealed combustion systems, uh, either a water heater or a furnace or a boiler that can also be vented through uh, it's fairly, a fairly easy path anyway, um, uh, directly instead of directly out those sidewalls instead of th up through a chimney. So that might be easier to locate. Uh, electric appliances like a uh, heat pump water heater, um, you know, if you did put one of those in a closet space, you'd have to account for, um, you know, the volume of air it needs and the sort of chilling effect that those water heaters have on the area that surrounds them. 
Um, and of course, you, you do need to talk to an electrician and a, and a heating contractor about what is feasible. You know, new wires would have to be run, new pipes and all that. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly uh, big lift to, to some extent in some homes. Thanks, Ben. Um, I, I, going back to the question that I meant to queue up for you, uh, from the chat, we have a question about heating options that are backup heat that were, are viable to keep somewhere other than the basement. Does that change your answer there at all? A backup heat that can be kept outside of the basement? Well, if you're, you know, as far as heating goes, the, the, I mean, ductless heat pumps was mentioned in the chat, I think, and whether that can heat the home and what kind of backup systems might be available that aren't in the basement. <clears throat> so yes, ductless heat pumps can be very effective at heating homes. Um, you know, most homes, I would say, would need some supplement to the ductless heat pumps. And this is maybe for about 20% of the winter when it's below 20 degrees. Uh, unless you have a, an efficient home, um, you're going to need a little bit more supplement. And that could be a pellet stove, that could be a wood stove, and it could be some other kind of space heater. Um, but those are all potential options. And yes, yeah, so duct switching to ductless heat pumps and some other supplement is a, is a good way to get things out of the basement. Thanks, Matt. Um, and I, I think, uh, again, I misread a question earlier. I think it was a question about insurance around heat pumps as a primary heat source. And ultimately, that is a question I think anyone would have to ask their insurer about. Um, Efficiency Vermont is not in a position to be able to discuss or, or really understand the scope of your um, insurance. So talk to your insurer about that before you make any decisions there. Moving on with a few more questions. Um, we're kind of going through some that are coming in through the chat as we read through some of these emailed questions that came in. So a few more questions about heating for you, Matt Sharp. Um, the flood ruined the furnace in my basement. I wanna put in only a cold climate heat pump. Do I need backup heating. I think we touched on that just a moment ago, but anything else to add in this context? Yeah, it, it's you know, kind of the same answer that just was given. It really depends on the home. And, and I would say, you know, talking to a contractor, doing a heat load analysis <clears throat> to really understand what your house needs for heating, especially after you've improved the insulation, uh, will get you closer to answering that. What I would say, if you're talking about a furnace, which is oftentimes referred to when uh, you're talking about a hot air delivery system, a ducted heat pump can be a good solution to fully heat the home. And part of the reason it can do that is that they have some ability to add an electric resistance supplement integrated to the system that can allow you for on the coldest of days, um, be able to heat. So you don't have to uh, size the heat pump or add so many more heat pumps to cover 100% of load down to 20 below, um, which only happens you know, once or twice a year. Okay, thank you, Matt. One last question for you. Um, my 160 year old house was flooded. I need to replace a large wood burning furnace. I had no backup heating other than firewood. What can I do? And before you answer there, Matt Sharp, I think another, this is another moment to remember, it's really critical to complete the FEMA process first and then consider any options and how Efficiency Vermont might fit into that picture. So again, that FEMA process, that insurance process is step one. And then Matt Sharp, how would you answer that question? Um, I, I mean, I think it, the decision point is, do you wanna at, replace your wood boiler with a wood boiler or something else? It, if you're gonna go back to a wood boiler as your central heating, um, that you could decide whether that's cordwood or pellet wood. Um, and then as far as a backup goes, uh, you know, the question is whether ductless heat pumps could be that backup. Um, they, they could be, um, they could be a backup to that or, a, or you could think of it the other way around too, where the heat pumps could be the primary driver, you know, for a large portion of the heating and provide cooling. And then <clears throat> your central system is the, is the backup or the supplement. Okay, thanks very much, Matt. Um, we are gonna, uh, we're entering in the final few minutes of the hour here, but I think we'll be able to stick around for a bit more to answer some more questions. So if you have a question and you haven't heard an answer yet, um, feel free to throw that in the chat. Um, I'm gonna take a look at some other questions that came in here. Li Ling, this question is for you. Um, what mold mitigation would you recommend on a concrete floor? 
Well, for all cleanup questions like that, we're really referring people to the EPA. They have great um, mold cleanup guidance. Um, the, that material is pretty resilient to a lot of uh, cleaning products that you could throw at it. And so I think that it's gonna be um, quite possible to return that to usable state, but um, Efficiency Vermont isn't really uh, dispensing advice about um, cleanup that we, we want to refer you to people with more expertise in that. And you can find guidance at the EPA. Thanks, Li Ling. Uh, Brad Lung, this is a question for you from the chat. Um, does Efficiency Vermont consider landlords a business the same way FEMA and the Small Business Administration do? What would you say? Well, I, I, think, I think I would say when it comes to the Small Business uh, Association and FEMA um, versus how Efficiency Vermont might view uh, a multifamily property. Um, it's, it's, I'm not going to comment on the FEMA and Small Business Association perspective, but from Efficiency Vermont's perspective, um, we're going to want to know if, uh, if, somebody, if a rental property owner is living on, in the property or not, and approximately how many units you have in that building. Um, I mentioned earlier, when it comes to rental properties, there are so many different types of rental properties. Um, give us a call and we'll be happy to have a discussion with you about your particular situation. I think, um, I think they're all a little unique, um, but we typically see a rental property as a business uh, and not a residential um, building. Thanks, Brad. Uh, this next question is for you, Allison. Um, it's a pretty technical one, so bear with me. The product list on Efficiency Vermont's website are all in the XLS format or for Excel. Why can't you make a PDF file or an HTML page? How would you answer someone looking for a more accessible version? Uh, certainly. So we are uh, evaluating ways to make that list more accessible. Uh, converting it to a PDF um, has not been optimal so far, but um, you do have the option to search our online database, which is the most up-to-date option. Um, in addition, if you do need that PDF to download to a device to take with you, um, as you shop, um, you're welcome to call in and request that from us, and we can send that to you uh, digitally. Thanks, Allison. Uh, here's a question uh, coming in the chat from Matt Sharp. Um, pretty straightforward, Matt. Can oil burners be direct vented? <clears throat> um, so straightforward, maybe. Uh, there are oil boilers that you can supply outside air to. Um, and there are exterior vent kits that can be added to oil boilers to vent them directly out of sidewall. Now, uh, you have to talk to an oil technician to see what's feasible for your situation, but those technologies do exist. If you were buying one new, you could certainly buy one with those characteristics. But if you're retrofitting one, you know, definitely talk to your technician about what's feasible. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Li Ling, this next question is uh, coming in for you. Uh, my basement's exposed fiberglass insulation in the ceiling got soaked by the humidity in the basement during the flood. It has dried out now. I see no indication of mold. Should it be replaced anyway? A mm, few different things going on there. One, I'm glad that the water didn't get high enough to soak even more than that. Um, but fiberglass is notorious for allowing moisture and air to pass through it. And so really the question is um, whether the floor above that, so the subfloor, which is probably wood and the flooring above that, which may be vinyl, maybe wood flooring, whether all of that is in good shape. And so here's a place where I would definitely recommend that a moisture meter be used to assess the building materials. Um, if it didn't get inundated, then it probably doesn't have silt and other kinds of icky stuff in it from the floodwaters. So this might be a case where you could retain it. But mainly I wanna ask, why is there insulation in the ceiling of your basement? If you're doing that because the floors are cold in the winter, I would say look to air sealing as a way to remedy that. If you have any water pipes, your water heater, any of your mechanical systems, maybe your clothes dryer, your heating, any of that down in the basement, then you have insulation in a place that doesn't fully enclose all of the things that you really want to be inside your house, which would be you know, your mechanical systems. So it might be that you don't really need that fiberglass up in the ceiling of your basement. And what you really need is to have a well-sealed basement 
to the outside. So the walls of the basement, the floor of the basement, if you have a bulkhead going down into the basement, that should be sealed well. So um, the straightforward answer is, yeah, maybe it can be left there, but check the wood um, moisture content. And then the second answer would be, um, is that really the right place for the installation in your building? Thanks, Li Ling. Another question coming in that I think uh, makes sense to direct towards uh, Matt Sharp. Um, so this person is asking, if I used closed cell foam on an exterior wooden wall and it were flooded again with water on both sides, would I need to remove the exterior siding to dry the wood behind the foam or is drying from just the inside sufficient? Um, so yeah, it's a good question. And I'm not sure there's a very concrete answer in, in all cases. Um, a lot depends on maybe what is your, your outside wall. Are, are there vapor control layers on the outside, whether that be a, an old siding material or a vinyl siding or some kind of uh, house wrap that is not letting moisture pass through and reducing the drying. Um, and how fast are you able to get it dry just by it drying to inside? And if, if you're testing the wood, if you're, if you're finding out how drying it's get after the first couple of days, um, you might need to open up the outside to let it dry. I did see one study that granted this was put out by a spray foam manufacturer that they did test a home that was flooded for moisture content with um, the exterior closed off and only drying to the inside using dehumidifiers and heat and ventilation. Um, and they were able to get it dry. So there's one example. Thanks, Matt. Uh, this next question I think is best directed towards Allison. Allison, this question reads, why do you only have rebates for large 80 gallon hybrid water heaters? What would you say? So the rebates that we have available are for heat pump water heater models, and they do vary uh, significantly in terms of capacity. Um, there is a column on the qualified product list that lists the um, gallons uh, capacity of those units, um, and they range um, from 40 gallons up to 80. So hopefully you'll be able to find one that meets your needs, and if you need help uh, selecting one, um, you can consult with the distributor or call us for um, additional assistance. Okay, thanks, Allison. We're uh, a little over time here, but just a few more questions to get to, so bear with us, folks. Um, Allison, uh, I'm sorry, thank you, Allison. Li Ling, this next question is gonna come to you. I think it's about moisture. So the question reads, our walkout basement is our bottom finished floor. We didn't have any flooding, but we have condensation and moisture coming up through the cement. The floor buckled in places. We used a dehumidifier and now we're insulating and making the house tighter. What can we do to manage the humidity in the whole house? Okay, so to start with, it sounds to me like maybe the flooring is preventing moisture that's underneath it from really drying out all the way. Um, I, I'm saying that because I'm gathering that you're still seeing evidence of moisture now so with the sweating and the um, humidity, maybe you have condensation on your windows um, in the morning. So you really, this, the very first thing, well, the cleanup is the first thing and then drying everything out is next. Um, if you're talking about the long-term and how to keep your, um, the humidity checked in your home um, after there's been a full recovery from the flood, um, it's back to the things that I mentioned before. So um, a ventilation system can help um, making sure that you don't have sources of moisture. So if there are, places in your basement where rainwater gets in every time it rains, like you got to take care of that. Maybe that means diverting roof water. Maybe it means regrading. Maybe it means finding places in the foundation that have a crack and are allowing the water in. Um, most basements in Vermont need a dehumidifier, you know, for most of the, the summer. Um, it's really the rare basement in Vermont that doesn't need that, uh, even newer basements. So, you know, dehumidifier is going to be important. If you know that you have sources, sources of moisture in the basement, um, you really need to take care of that if you're going to protect the rest of the house. And then finally, um, it's not clear to me whether the buckled floor was happening before the flood or this is a, as a result of the flood, but if it was happening before the flood, it's quite possible that you don't have a vapor retorter on the slab 
mostly the vapor, for the most part, you'll find a vapor retarder under the slab, but some homes that had the slab poured after the home was finished. So an older home that maybe had a slab added 30 or 40 years after the home was built, that may not have a vapor barrier under the slab. And then a vapor barrier needs to be put on top of the slab because somehow you need to keep the moisture that's in the soil from coming up into the house. Thanks, Li Ling. I think we'll wrap up with this last question. And you know, I'm really not sure if this is a question for Matt Sharp or Li Ling. So uh, I'll pose it to you both. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward, uh, I should say, brief question. Um, should I seal the cracks in my basement floor? If so, what do you recommend to do that? Who's going to take this question? <laughs> I mean, I think I'd start just by saying if, you know, let's assume you have a dry basement and you want to seal the cracks to keep soil gas from entering or keep air leakage from happening, then absolutely, yes, you want to seal the cracks to control uh, soil gas entry, moisture entry, and air leakage. Um, if you have active water entry and that crack is actually allowing some of the water that comes in to drain out, and that crack is sort of connected to larger pathways of water inside that basement, then you really want to try to address the, the underlying problem there before you start sealing things off. I don't know, what what do you say, Li Ling? Thumbs up from Li Ling, that's great. Okay, um, we're going to finish up here. Just a few more slides before we say uh, goodbye for the evening. Just a few quick things to remember. Um, first, it's vital to make sure you complete that FEMA and insurance process first. We, we can't stress that enough. So please make sure you complete your FEMA application and go through that process. And then you'll be ready to talk with uh, our folks at Efficiency Vermont. As you rebuild, remember your home is a system everything is connected. Efficiency Vermont is here to help you address health, safety, and energy efficiency as you rebuild. You can learn about rebates and other resources we have right now at efficiencyvermont.com flood. And there are new Efficiency Vermont flood recovery offers coming in September. So stay tuned. We are very eager to get you those details as soon as they are final. All right. Now, one last time, any other questions? You can get expert advice, clear answers, objective advice from an Efficiency Vermont energy expert. That phone number is right there, 1-888-921-5990. You can also email info at efficiencyvermont.com. Okay, that's it from us uh, for us this evening. Thank you everybody for your questions and for your time. And uh, we will hopefully be able to follow up with any questions we didn't answer in the chat. Thanks so much. <laughs>